Hey, welcome to the Humans of Sydney podcast today. Um, if you tuned in last week with Jack Jacobs, thank you a lot. We found that one to be really, really interesting. Um, if you're tuning in for the first time of our podcast, so basically this is a podcast where we just interview people we find really interesting um, and inspiring. And today we've got uh, Riz and Sachin's going to introduce him. Okay, so I'll go through the formal stuff first. Um, so Riz in the past has had three degrees from a and yeah, I know you didn't want me to mention that. <laughs> Um, he's co-founded a startup called Bindle, which was the number in 2013, the most crowdfunded platform at the time. Mobile app, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Time, yeah. You've been a consultant at KPMG in the past, a senior policy advisor for the government, <laughs> and okay. he's currently working at Hamper, um, which is kind of started two and a half years, which we'll go into in a little bit. But aside from the formal stuff, Riz has been a mentor of mine for the last two years. I kind of had a stint of working at his company, Hamper. Um, it's more of a, I think it's a relationship where you kind of try and live your youth again through me <laughs> and then I <laughs> try and get yeah, as much yeah, knowledge yeah, as well Just you, so you know, probably. on exchange, Sachin literally did not stop talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> like every day he'd be like, oh, oh Riz wants to do this, Riz <laughs> wants to do this. So yeah, oh, man, this is the first time, good stuff. yeah, I'm meeting Riz, but I sort of already know him. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah I, really I feel the same. Feel <laughs> the same. Um, all right, so let's jump straight into it. Yeah, so can you just it. tell us about your experiences in the past, the journey to get where you are right mm. now? We won't mention your age, but <laughs> we're just <laughs> the yeah, journey. How old are you again? <laughs> Humans <laughs> of Sydney. <laughs> all right, that covers all ages. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, that's a broad question. Um, my experiences. Okay, I, I'll try to wrap it up real quick. Yeah. Um, yeah yes, you're right. Went to, went to uni, did... Um, basically, yeah, economics is, is kind mm. of my background and, and a bit you're of... You're born in Canberra, well. right? Uh, no, I was actually born overseas. I, came, okay. I moved to Canberra when I was 11 months old. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, my family uh, immigrated from Bangladesh. Um, anyways, yeah. So, yeah, d- economics mostly uh, with a bit of law. Um, I, I guess through uni, I, like I really enjoyed uni. It was fun. Um, but I always kind of knew that I didn't didn't really want to work a desk job or uh, like mm. a lot of the things I learned at uni I was like oh shit is this actually am I ever going to use yeah, this we or, go through that like every day <laughs> yeah yeah so similar stuff actually, but, um, <laughs> and it was something like it, it was weird because I had like you, you know you have your exams and you're like oh I'm going to try real hard to sort of smash that exam but at the end of it, it it's kind of like well what's what's the point of all of this mm. anyways whatever finished uni got a grad job just like a lot of people do um and I think I kind of convinced myself that um it was what I wanted to do. Yeah. So I ended up working for a, a solid, what was it? Probably a bit of five years straight. Mm. Like what did, company did was that for? I worked at KPMG. Okay. I worked in government. I worked at the ACCC. Yeah. Conventionally um, very successful. <laughs> conventionally, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, um, but I, 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 not that I didn't enjoy it. I didn't feel comfortable. So I yeah. didn't feel mm. comfortable working at a desk. I didn't feel comfortable um, working in a large organization. And I didn't feel comfortable kind of feeling like uh, you're quite dispensable, which yeah. you know, uh, makes sense. Um, and I guess throughout uni, um, a few mates, um, a few of our mates and I, we, we were always into startup, into business and it not necessarily start, actually, I don't like, I'll, I don't like using the word startup. I'll just say business. I'll okay. explain a little while later, but we're always into business ideas and, and trying to do things, whether it was, you know, um, selling shit at uni or, you know, getting t-shirts from overseas or whatever it might be. What would be like an example of that selling stuff at uni? Um, like, uh, basically literally buying t-shirts from China and trying to sell them. Uh, okay. should, yeah, for, um, in, in the union court. So, yeah. You guys have a union court here? What's that? I don't know what that is. I went to, I went to ANU. So, basically, you're the median strip. Okay. Yeah, yeah we have Eastern Ave. Yeah. Yeah. Eastern Ave, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so always used to come up with ideas, um, but never really went through with, mm. with anything the whole way. And I guess, you know, it was a mix of uh, you you'd try something and then, you know, the end of uni would come up and you'd be on holidays and you'd, you'd do something else or exams would come up and something would, dist- would distract you. Um, and then, yeah, so end, end up getting into work uh, and I never felt comfortable. I never felt like, you know, I, I think I'd performed well at some places and, you know, I, I think I could have had a decent career, um, but I never felt comfortable. And you know that feeling you get sometimes when you're just like, you don't feel fulfilled. Yeah, for sure. All um, the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, you guys are, you, should, you should be chilling. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. um, I felt that quite strongly, maybe not my first year of work, but definitely yeah. the last three or four years, like every year it got mm. more and more. Did you feel pressure to go into the workforce and work at like like a big four sort of thing, like by your parents or maybe friends or just pressure society. on yourself? Society, yeah. I think. Um, I know that sounds kind of 
ridiculous. Mm. But yeah, hundred percent, absolutely. I mean, think about it. You go into uni, you've just taken on a bunch of debt. Or, yeah. You know, you've paid for this degree. Um, like, why? Why did? And it's not just money. It's like the time, three or four years you spend. Yeah. Mm. You, you pressure yourself and just, like you know it's mm. a thing to do you you go to uni you get a job um and i didn't it's weird like the the notion especially back then like i'm i'm a bit you know, a bit older than you guys um it wasn't i don't think it, it's never really been that conventional to for young people in in modern society to go and start their own business mm. right so yeah definitely a lot of pressure um i feel like it's also competitiveness as well because if you know yeah. that you're like you can do these jobs like investment banking, yeah. management consulting and you have like the aptitude to do them it's like oh why wouldn't you do them kind of thing if all these other guys at the same yeah. level kind yeah. of are doing them that's something we feel like <laughs> used to love, particularly in, like the discipline of finance everyone's sort of getting internships at like the last couple years yeah, yeah. people just become really competitive and it becomes a bit of a bubble it's, it's yeah. easy to set your standards the same as them because you know you can do it and compete yeah. on that level mm. and i think from like i think all three of us are pretty naturally competitive so it's just like i think i think so i think uh, competition definitely has something to do with it but yeah. Like, as I kind of grew older, I, I started to realize, look, it's horses for courses. So what I mean, like, sh- what I'm saying is if you want to be an investment banker and you're comfortable yeah. and that's what you want to do and that's, mm. you know, g- going to make you feel fulfilled, it's fine. Mm. But if you just don't feel like you want to do that and you mm. and the only reason you're really doing it is because you, you feel society's telling you or you feel competitive, that's the stupidest reason to do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and I don't think money should be... be um, the biggest driver. And I think in a country like Australia, it's kind of silly to say that money's a driver when, you know, tradies can earn just as much in as, as like, you know, uh, someone who works in management mm, consulting literally. or something like that. So I think I think that's a bit of bullshit. But, um, but society in general kind of says, look, if you go to uni, and especially in finance or law or economics or something like that, it's like, yeah, go to uni, finish up, get a, get a job, be a grad, you know, work your ass off for five years and you'll be a you know, yeah. senior manager or whatever and you move up. And You're then sort eventually... of waiting for that period when you can sort of yeah. have more free time or earn greater amounts of money and stuff. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think you, you're in this rat race to kind of chase something and there's nothing wrong with that. There's actually, like, I, I, I think it makes sense. Like, if, if people want to do it, do it. Um, and do you wish you could be contented with that? Because that's like sometimes like, oh, should should we be contented with that? Do we wish we could just be like, okay, uh, that's cool? I don't think you should wish you should be anything. I should just, I think you should just be what you feel. Like, yeah. Does it, like do what you feel, kind of thing. So if you feel like you want to be um, a manager at a consulting firm or whatever, a director or something, go for it. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you, when you do it, if you feel good doing it, do it. Mm. Um, I, I just think like, but if you don't, stop. Like yeah. that's that's the biggest thing in society now. Like people just do shit because and, and they feel trapped. But there's no there's no one like you know that that's got you there. Yeah. You can leave yeah. trapped by yourself. Time. Yeah, you're trapped by yourself. But and then you get the fifty year old midlife crisis, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know it's, it's terrible. <laughs> um, but anyways, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So basically, uh, finished up and then sorry. Uh, in my la- last job that I had, I think it was during my last job. Um, a few of my close friends and I, we, we tried to do, we were like, okay, we've tried bullshit startup ideas in the past that are like what I call side hustles. Mm-hmm. Let's do something that's not so much of a side hustle. It ended up being a side hustle. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, um, you know, get into that. Mm-hmm. But so, so we came up with this idea essentially was to help, this is back in 2013, I think. Mm-hmm. So it was um, kind of pre-Instagram being as big as it is now and pre, I guess, um, I'll, I'll say Tinder, but Tinder's for more for dating, but pre-apps where you could meet other people. Yeah. Mm. Um, so we just came up with an idea to help travellers connect with one another and share photos and videos of places. Mm. So, you, you know, you, you go somewhere into a new city, jump on, you can find all these other places that people have been to, how they rank them, you know, visit yeah. them, um, and meet other travellers as well. Yeah. Anyways, uh, long story short, um, won't get into it. It failed because of a number of different reasons. Um, but the primary reason in my mind, every one of us that were in the business would probably say something completely different. And, you know, yeah, I appreciate that. But for me personally, it was that um, building a business, building a side hustle um, that is purely actually a side hustle, you can do on the side. So if you want to start a website to sell T-shirts or, um, I don't know, posters or some shit like that, go build a Wix site or a Shopify site, do it, and you can do it at night and you can make some money. But... If you want to build a business that's going to be a business in and of itself, like like a something that you're going to have to work with, and you, your vision for the business is to you know bring on staff and grow the company, um, I think there there has to be a tipping point where 
you go all in. Yeah. So were you not all in when you first started it? Was this while you're working, you were doing it I was this working full time. Oh, yeah, yeah, shit, doing okay. it at night. And I, and I think I was towards the end of my masters at the time as well. So it was it was That's pretty full on time. Pretty heavy. And yeah. weren't some of the people all in already or was that No, no, three of us were all were working and yeah. one of the guys um he yeah, he came on all in towards the end cuz he just finished uni. Okay. okay. Um so he he kind of came in towards the end of it full time and you know, a mismatch of I won't say a, a mismatch of a vision or anything. I think the, the thing was like, there was so much to do, but we were working at night. And it's really hard because your day job kicks up or, you know, uni kicks up and then the startup goes to the bottom. Yeah. So a master's, a full-time job and, yeah, and startup on the side. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it was a good experience in that I learned a shit ton. Yeah. Mm. Um, I linked the crowdfunding video in the comments because I was showing people at my work the other day and they still think it's amazing, yeah. even though it was made yeah. in 2013. Yeah, it's an yeah, amazing yeah. video. Uh, we'll link yeah. it in there. It's crazy. It's 2019. <laughs> that's, it's yeah. yeah. So oh, what yeah, made you want to start that particular business? Um, so I'd done, while I was at uni, so my friends and I pretty much every, not pretty much, every single year we would um, save up all year and go on a holiday. Okay. So we'd go to a different part of the world and that was kind of... Um, that kind of made it bearable. Cause yeah. havoc in different okay. parts of the world. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but that's what kind of I've made it I've heard a couple stories of the havoc. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. A bit of trouble. Yeah, um, yeah let's not get into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so traveling was very um, dear to us and, mm. and we understood like how many, you know, meeting new people, having new experiences, that was something that built your character, built you as a person. Yeah. Um, and then kind of through that, we, we you know, over talking, we just came up with the idea one day. Mm. Um, and yeah, like we, yeah, it, it, I still think it was a good idea. Um, we just didn't execute properly. Yeah. Are so. there any businesses now that are similar to that and are, that are thriving currently? Um, look, the travel space is, is huge, right? Obviously. But um, I think TripAdvisor tried, is trying their best to do what they can in that space. But mm -hmm. um, not really. Yeah. Not really in, in the sense that what we were trying to do, which is to use people's experiences to share to other people. Yeah. I think it's still commercial experiences going, uh, com, you know, commercial companies trying to mm -hmm. um, share their experiences. But um, but I still think it's a good idea if, if yeah. someone could, could get off. Yeah, you told me, you, you, he, like, if we, if we want to pick it up, we can. Yeah. <laughs> Take, <laughs> Take the code. I'll give you the code. <laughs> um, but... Sorry, what was I saying? What was the question? <laughs> uh, just, okay, the, you've, you've been now, now that and then after Bindle. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Sorry. So... Um, after that, I was like, not burnt by it. That's definitely not, not the right word. Um, it sucked. Yeah. It was kind of like... a bit demoralized? Yeah, demoralizing. Yeah, that's definitely demoralized. But also just like, just felt shitty. Yeah, yeah, I guess. yeah. yeah, yeah. Just like, oh man. Um, and then kind of like trying to piece back, okay, what happened? And it wasn't, it, it took, we were at it for about what? 12 to eight, maybe 18 months. Mm -hmm. Was there um, breakdowns in friendship in that as well? No, I don't think there were okay. breakdowns in friendship. I think... Um, the guy, we were pretty close friends. And look, doing business with friends is, um, is tough. Yeah. Um, but you need to learn how to kind of set expectations and barriers. And mm -hmm. it's not something that I would say is the right thing to do all the time. It depends mm -hmm. on the friendship. Yeah. On, yeah. on how you guys know each other. Um, but no, it, it didn't break down friendships, but, it, but it, was, it was tough. And then one of the guys, like, you know, in retrospect, it was good because uh, I'm, my new business that you start up with is with one of the guys. And one of the other guys actually went and started his own startup over in... Um, uh, Cambodia, which is all you should so, get him on the show actually. Yeah, was well. that He's, Afnan? Yeah, 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 yeah I've yeah, heard yeah. really. We should things actually about on the topic of Afnan. You, um, once I was having an existential crisis, I went to Riz. I was like, should I get a grad job? Should I pursue a startup? Blah blah blah. And he told me about <laughs> Afnan's promise that when he gra graduated uni, <laughs> he would not. Um, yeah, he made a promise yeah. to himself that he'd never get a grad really? job. Really? And it's it's because it, Afnan's cool. about three years younger than me, right? Yeah. So, but we we're pretty close friends. I'm, I used to be. Oh, well, I am like best friends with his brother, mm. um, but then him and I became um, best mates as well. Um, and I kind of would always tell him as, as he was going through uni, I was like, you can, you know, do something different. Mm. Um, and, I and I didn't think, he, and I, I'd kind of say it with a pinch of salt saying, you know, don't get a grad job. But yeah. he, he promised himself he wouldn't yeah. get a grad job. So, um, yeah, definitely. We'll get, put, we'll get put Okra Solar down below as well, because it's a really interesting company. Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. For sure. Um, yeah, they're doing some real cool stuff. And I, I actually think you should get them on the show. But um, yeah, so coming out of that, I promised myself, I said, look, um, now you're in a shitty situation, Riz, because you've, um, you're still stuck at your desk job. Yeah. Um, which is even worse now, because you kind of had a taste of, you know, how exciting trying to build something else can be. 
um, but that thing that you're building is gone and you, you're left with nothing. Um, so it was pretty, that, that, that was pretty shitty. Um, but I, I kind of promised myself, I said, look, I'm not going to ever do anything again unless two things happen. Um, number one, I'm a non-technical person, which means I'm not a coder, right? So I said, I'm not going to, and, and, and I'm not a coder and I don't think I want to be a coder. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are not coders who are like, oh, I'll learn yeah. how to code. For me, me and Sachin talk a lot about this. Like we always want to learn to code and we do it for a little bit and we realize like that's not really us. We just got to sort of stick to our guns, like maybe learn a bit of it, but like realize we're not going to be that technical yeah. person uh, on the team. Uh, you know, sidetrack, best way I explain it is this, is that if you're going to build a product, like like some, some sort of technical product, you need someone who's mm. a full-time coder, like a proper coder. If you're going to build a splash page or some sort of e basic e-commerce shit, okay. go learn how to code and you can build that pretty yeah. easily. So, But there's depths, there's levels. So mm. it depends on what you're doing. But for me, I was never going to be, and I never wanted to be like a like a full-on coder. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, I, I don't think I could do it actually, yeah. to be honest. Um, so I, I said, promised myself, I said, look, my strengths are strategy, marketing, sales, um, you know, um, getting product out there, product as well. I was like, I'm only going to do something if I find if I find a co-founder who is technical, mm -hmm. um, and that that I can work with. So that was the first thing. Because sorry, from the Bindle experience, just to let you know, um, one of the other one of the key reasons uh, that it kind of we didn't get across the line is because we ran out of money because we were developing it mostly overseas. Yeah, and that just I was just like you know if you're and it was the the process of developing something outside at that point was just really frustrating for me um, because. You can't just get shit done. You, you, there's communication breakdowns. Um, if you scope something up and they're building it and then you want to change something, it's hard and you waste money and all these things. So I was like, no, only going to work with, only going to do something if I can work with someone who's a coder. That was the first thing. The second thing was um, that Bindle was probably um, what I would call kind of like, like a, Kind of like a, one of those Facebook dreams, right? So it was an idea mm. that if it made sense, it would be sick. Like if everyone yeah. uses this thing, then it's going to be awesome and then we'll monetize, yeah. right? So it depended on lots of people using it, using it, um, uploading photos, you know, actually getting engaged mm. and then it would have a lot of, you know, you know monetary value. But the truth is, I think that those ty types of startups, like it's it's one in you know, a million yeah. or whatever so it is, right? you can all or nothing. You need to get everyone using it and monetize or yeah. it doesn't really So you need to have much. like a revenue plan from the start. Yeah, so, so I promised myself I'm not going to do anything unless I can make money yeah. from, from the start because um, let, let's be honest, like, you, uh, yes, you can come up with an idea and raise a shit ton of capital. It's quite difficult to raise a lot of capital in Australia off an idea. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even if you... You know, even if you can raise that capital with an idea, unless that idea has a clear way to make money, um, you know, you could go four or five years deep into something yeah. and then it just goes shit. The VCs so, are pretty scared here, right? Then they're not like forward thinking as much. Uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I, I, I think the VCs here, um, I, think, I think the VC market's getting a lot better. Okay. It, it, like the, it, it, yeah, a, a lot of um, more forward thinking VCs. Are, VC stands for venture capital. For anyone yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, no, I, 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 I wouldn't say that. I would just say that we've got less money. Yeah. Um, we've got less money. We've got a smaller population. We're physically isolated from the rest of the world. And our cities are very distant from one another, which makes it very difficult. Not do, it's, it's a much higher risk to launch a product in Australia. Think about it this way. Um, if you're sitting in New York, right, and you launch a product in New York, Literally an hour down the road, you've probably got another few million people. Then mm. you go, you know, a couple hours down to Boston. Yeah, bigger then, markets. You know, it's literally like you've got 300 million people there or whatever it is, and every state's in Australia. Yeah. Like 20 million. So you can push here, push here, push here and grow. Whereas in Australia, <clears throat> two things. Culturally, we're, we're very close to Asia, but culture, I mean, I mean, physically we're very close to, close to Asia, but culturally very different. So our yeah. products don't always work, which means that you can't just pick it up and literally just go, yeah, let's go to Indonesia. Yeah. You've got to make tweaks. Whereas in the States or even in Europe, you can probably navigate through pretty quickly. Anyways, there's a number of reasons which I think makes it difficult, uh, which makes Australian startups more risky. Um, because even, even with what we're doing, for example, ideally we'd make it work in Australia. But even if you're the best in Australia, um, the amount of revenue that you can generate in Australia is nothing when you yeah, compare that to limited. going to America, Canada, mm. 
um, the UK or Europe or, or like China and of course Southeast Asia is huge and I think that's a good place to go as well. But I guess what I'm saying is you need to, startups in Australia need to grow, um, do well enough in Australia or build a product that's strong enough to go overseas okay. as quickly as possible. It's, it, it is what it is kind of thing. It's just market size. Hmm. Um, so anyway, sorry. So I said to myself, look, I'm only going to do, do a business if, um, if I work with a co-founder who's technical, extremely technical, and I can, um, we, we have something that can make money from day one. So anyways, long story short, um, I got married. And, uh, <laughs> How old are you when you got married? I was 27. Uh, yeah. We're going to revisit this and you can tell that story about how you met your wife. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Is it appropriate or? No, no it's, it's appropriate. Oh, okay. It's very cute, actually. <laughs> yeah. it might be at, like a rave or something. <laughs> Bit of a romantic. Um, no, no. So, uh, yeah, got married. Um, and then I kind of uh, probably would have, would have been like early on, like, you know, three, four months into us being married, I was just like, turn around to my wife and I was like, one day, look, I think I want to, like, I don't think I could live with myself if I get another 10 years into my career and look back and say that I only tried this thing. Yeah. Um, and I, like, I've got to do this. Um, will you support me? And she said, yes. So then she, I think she said something like, you got 12 months to make, to, to make it or else you got to go back to work and make money. Yeah. No, she, she, she didn't say, but yeah, basically okay. 12 months, right? So I was like, okay, sweet. Um, and around that time, I started coming up with this concept um, and then met with uh, one of my best mates who's a software engineer, mm -hmm. um, Steve, who's actually... That guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you go to uni with him or...? Just... I went to high school uh, oh, from year seven. I've known him for a long time. Yeah. So we, we go way back. Um, Very interesting person. He's he's a uh, one you would consider him one of the best like computer programmers, right? Oh, he's genius, and yeah. 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 And, he's, <laughs> yeah. and he's got just like the most bubbly personality and stuff like that. He's yeah. a really good guy. He's, he's really cool. You got to come check out our office. He's making it pretty quirky. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty quirky guy. Yeah, quirky, quirky is the right word. He's, he's, he's cool. Um, but no, I um, uh, yeah. So caught up with Steve and I was and explained the idea to him and we kind of spoke about it and yeah, kind of went from there and then just threw in the towel quit my job and here I am two and a half years later and you know yeah it's I, th I think it's going well. the, the problem is I hate it when people say oh how's the business going or how's your startup going because um, it's relative right like at any given within a day like half the time I'll be like oh shit like everything's gonna like I this is the worst thing that I could yeah. ever do and the other half I'll feel extremely rewarded but you kind of learn to kind of walk that line um, so yeah, I think it's going well now. I think, I think we're growing, um, but, uh, it's a hell of a ride. Do you want to quickly explain yeah. what you do while we're on Hamper? Uh, just very quickly. So basically it's a, um, it's a platform to help ma officers manage anything and everything they need to buy to, to upkeep the office. So whether it's catering, fruit, milk, um, office services, uh, cleaners, bar, uh, bar staff, event, um, space, whatever. So anything that, that an office would buy, um, t for the office or for the staff, mm -hmm. you, you buy through Hamper. Mm. Um, and the reason this was so interesting for me was, um, okay, I'll give you the quick quick, quick overview. The reason this is interesting for me was because coming out of Bindle, um, when we launched Bindle in Sydney, we actually got a number, quite a few users on board pretty quickly, which was good, which was awesome actually. We had like, yeah, a couple thousand or something. Um, but most of the content back then that was being generated, like, I mean, when I say most, probably over 95% of the content that was organically being generated by users was food. Mm. So photos of food being tagged at, like, yeah. at restaurants. and So know, these were tourists on. taking photos? No, um, we had tourists and locals. So okay. Bindle wasn't just for tourists, it was for locals to discover their backyard as well. Oh, so okay. you, know, you know, Sydney's cool. pretty segregated. Like if you live in the West, oh, yeah. actually, I feel like people in the West go everywhere. I, I'm from the West. Um, but people, yeah, people in the East people, just stay people, there. <laughs> people, nah, but I, I feel like Sydney's quite segregated in that people don't even know much yeah. that's going on everywhere else. Um, so yeah, a lot of, huh? No, it's just the West. Like, <laughs> yeah. this, like He literally has been to the inner West like once and he thinks he's going to get stabbed. It was a cultural shock. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like oh, the most man. wholesome like, family place. Jeez. It's the weirdest views on it. Do you know that most of Sydney lives in West Yeah, Sydney? yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so, that, so we had a lot of people and they were posting about food. So I got to thinking, that's interesting, like what's happening there uh, and why. Uh, and then we kind of started, uh, what happened? I think towards the tail end of it, when everything was like, you know, crumbling and going, going pear-shaped, um, 
we 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 thought, hey, let's maybe tra- uh, change this thing into like a food platform okay. where people can find food, good food mm-hmm. around town. And we're like, that kind of makes sense. So I ended up doing a shit ton of research on food, like the food market and technology and what, you know, um, who's doing what and what the margins are where. Um, and I kind of noticed that, you know, there was all these people that were doing B2C, so business to consumer um, websites for food. So at, back then, it, I don't think Uber was around back then, but maybe Deliveroo, uh, Menu Foodora. Log, Foodora, um, that's just in Australia, yeah. overseas, there's a whole bunch. So it was obviously a hot space and you would never in a million years want to launch something in B2C because it's way too competitive, mm. right? Like you're going to just, like right now it's impossible. Uber would kill you. Uber Eats, um, or yeah, I think Uber Eats would kill you. Deliver, I, no offense, but I think Deliver is <laughs> <laughs> not going to be able to compete with Uber Eats. Anyways, um, but then I noticed this, I noticed that corporates in Australia alone spent over a billion and a half dollars um, just on food. Mm. So I was like, shit, that's really interesting. Um, but there weren't many technological solutions to help them buy that food. Yeah. Um, and I kind of looked into it and I guess, long story short, uh, if I'm going to sell, if you're going to buy this mobile phone off a website, off an e-commerce website, a B2C marketplace, um, whether it's eBay or Amazon or whatever, right? It's pretty simple. You're a consumer, you jump on, um, you see the phone, you either buy it or you don't. They might have three or four color options for you, but that's it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you're not going to, um, if you ask for the phone to be extra large or some, some, you know, for them to customize it for you, they wouldn't do it. But if you're a corporate and if you're, I don't know, BHP and you say, hey, I want a thousand phones for my employees and they each need to be, you know, red. And I know you don't make red phones, but you've got to do them and blah, blah, blah. Like the phone company who would never have spoken to you about it will actually engage BHP because mm-hmm. for them, corporates are more money, more frequent, more reliable, you know, just yeah. bigger, bigger purse there. So we thought, okay, uh, so I started to think, okay, why do corporates, um, uh, why do corporates not purchase using the existing marketplaces? It's because they're not suited for corporates. So long story short, there's a whole bunch of pre-purchase and post-purchase things that need to happen. This is getting technical and boring, I know, I apologize. <laughs> um, so we're trying to build a marketplace that's purely for corporates, B2B. Um, and that helps suppliers do everything that they need and um, corporates do everything that they need to negotiate and buy and sell. Awesome. And I think if we can do that effectively, we'll be able to capture a lot of market. Yeah. Anyways. So do you have a lot of clients that are ongoing or are they sort of random? And no, no, we're, we're, we're growing now. We've got quite a few customers that, okay. are, that are kind of um, using the platform um, every day. Yeah, yeah. sick. Yeah. All right, we'll yeah. um, attach a link to Hamper down below and check yeah, that yeah, yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, check, <laughs> it out. check it out. Probably not um, the target market, but no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so you touched on this, like every day you have a bit of doubt, all that kind of stuff. I want to explore that a little bit more because I think it's so important. Not many entrepreneurs actually talk about it. They just talk about all the success and stuff, but it mm. is a very daunting task, especially when yeah. you used to have um, a corporate job, you could yeah. have a steady income, all that kind of stuff. And there's always doubt. Can you like talk about that a little mm. bit? Especially like that would be interesting to hear from a perspective of university students wanting to start their own thing yeah. and mm. the sort of doubt they face. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, oh, okay, so how do I put it? Um, starting a business is, um, the start is really exciting. Okay, mm. and I think um, that's why I like the concept of like, especially when you're sitting at uni in the lecture, you're like, shit, this is boring. Like, yeah. let's start a business thing. And the first steps are so easy now. You can build a landing page so quickly, validate so quickly. Everyone like, will <laughs> wear the lean startup, <laughs> validate some shit, do yeah. some shit, whatever, it's done. Yeah. But I, there's, there's this period between like, I, I, for me, it's the first full year of a business where um, it's actually pretty hell. Like, like really hell. Like I'd, I've worked in pretty stressful environments in the past. Um, but I don't think I was ever as stressed as I was in the first year of this. Mm. Like, it, mm. not even, could not compare. Yeah. Um, and it's r- like, so if you were to, s- in my first year, I don't know what kept me going except for my yeah. ego. Really? It wasn't like, now I'll tell you, you know, half the day I feel shit, half the day I feel good, which is true mm. for now. Mm. But in my first year, I just felt shit. Um, maybe the first few months when I was, you know, it's fine and you're trying to like build a product and stuff. Mm. But when you get the product into market, um, it's hard, mm-hmm. like building it. And I don't think there's anybody who's gonna tell you a different story. As, as, if they're honest, they're not gonna tell you a different story. Like building any business is so freaking hard. Um, and that's why coming back to the whole startup and you know, non-startup thing, like I, I, 
I have respect for anyone that's in business. Because if you're in business and you're successful, that means you're a hustler. You've done some shit. Mm. And, and like, I've got a lot of respect for that. Um, so I think for, for uni students, I think the biggest thing to appreciate is that it's, it's not easy. Um, but that being said, it's kind of like, it is so rewarding. Mm. Like, incredibly rewarding. Because even if, so if I made, say, 150 grand in my job, right, a year or something like that. If, I, if you make 10 grand and you make it yourself, there's not that money feel, like everything feels so good. Mm. It's just like shit, like I, we, I did this, it's, it's crazy. So the reward, um, risk, like the reward ratio is in, incredible. Um, but it's hard, it's really hard. Mm. And that's why I think, um, you know, it takes a certain amount of grit to kind of get through and, and build, build a business. Um, I, it, it kind of scares me a little bit that there are so many, oh, I don't want to say this. How do I say this? Okay. I feel like startup and entrepreneurship is the cool thing now. Yeah. Right. Um, but I feel like it's because people are kind of at, at, at this level of, of getting into the startup. It's like, oh yeah, I've, I've done the lean startup stuff. I've got, I've validated the idea. I've got the landing page. I raised, you know, 25 grand or 50 grand for my, for my prototype. Still pretty fun stuff because you know, let's be honest when you where you're not a business yet right mm. you're like you're trying to prove something but when you're in there getting customers eating shit every single day um, that's like that's I, I don't know how many people actually penetrating through to that level mm. Mm. right someone said something very interesting to me about that on Friday at that hackathon I was talking about it she said you are not your product you have to separate yourself from your product because some days when you feel shit it feels like you are your product and every yeah. hit on the product is on you and it's yeah just yeah like, oh a- absolutely I, I think. You, it, it it toughens you up a lot. Mm. Um, so, it, and, and that's why I think during uni, it's it's a good, it, it's the best time yeah. to kind of start something. But at the same time, you need to know when that, that point is that you're going to maybe take the semester off mm. and go right in. Because it's one of those things like, why do a startup if you don't want it to grow and be successful? Like, why waste your time, mm. right? So if, if your ultimate goal is to build a business that's going to be successful, um, then there's going to be a point when you have to take that risk mm-hmm. and just jump off the cliff, right? And I guess for me, the, the biggest things are just whatever risk you're taking, accept, um, just accept the worst case scenario in your heart, in your gut. If you're like, yeah, the worst case is that I'm going to lose a year and a half of my uni and I'll be a year and a half older than everyone else in my cohort, which doesn't mm. matter. Um, but anyways, a year and a half um, older than everyone and I'm going to be negative 30 Gs in debt and I'm not going to have traveled for two years. That's the worst case scenario. Yeah. And, and, you're, and if you can accept that, then just go. Just, mm. just, just go and, and eat shit for a year yeah. and then come back to uni if it fails. Yeah. I feel like when you're in uni, you tend to sort of overstate those risks as well. Like being just like a year behind, like your friends and stuff, it does not matter <laughs> at all. Like why just go into uni straight away from high school and just go straight oh. into a job? Like it's so fine to take time off and yeah. just do things that you want to do. And it's just like, people you, say that. So you actually boring. want to be 21 years old working full time. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't want to be working full time when I'm 21 yeah, kind of thing. If you want yeah. to, I, I don't think it matters. Uh, yeah, it's, it's weird. And I felt the same way. Like when I was at uni, I was like, oh, you know, got to go straight into uni from high school, or whatever, and, yeah. you know, finish, finish as quick as I, ca- as I can and things like that. But um, I don't think employers give a shit. Yeah. Like mm. no one cares if you're 24 or 25. Mm. Doesn't make a difference. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's what, I, I was thinking about this actually recently. I think it's because when you're 20 years old, one year of your life is 5%. Yeah. So it's a, it's a significant chunk. You're like, oh man, like I'm going to lose a year of my life. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm screwed. But I guess the older you get, a year becomes nothing, yeah. right? So it's just like, just just do it. Um, and I think, so, so anyways, I would say, uh, I'm coming back to ha- how you feel in a startup. Um, the first year is the hardest. It's, it's mm. the first proper year. So not the, not when I mean the first year after jumping off the cliff, when you just go, yep, I got no security, nothing. Like I'm, I need to start eating tuna cans every day. Yeah. That, 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 we that's, do that already. It's working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, that, that sucks. But, you know, every stage of building a business is, has its own kind of um, challenges. So, you know, we've raised capital now. Um, and if I compare kind of pre-raise to post-raise, like I, I have headaches. They're just different headaches. Like mm-hmm. post pre-raise, you're usually going to be the only person in the business or maybe one, one or two other people. Um, which means that you are doing everything. 
Yeah. Like every single thing in the business, you, you, you are the last line of defense and you always have to be the last line of defense. So you just have to think that whenever anyone drops a ball or whatever happens, I'm gonna have to deal with it. So you have to deal with everything. Um, post raise or you know when you get a bit bigger, the challenges are di just different. Like you, like for me, I've probably pulled myself out from, you know, the the grassroots work. I'm am still close, but now it's about you know okay strategically making sure that I find the right people to do the right jobs so mm. we can so we can grow and go, go to new markets. So, do you enjoy that stuff better? Um, yeah, definitely. So and that's that's the thing, right? Um, now in in at Hamper now in this business two and a half years later. I am at the point where I thought it was going to be when I started the business. Mm. So, and that's probably the, the biggest, when I'm saying you need to eat shit, what I'm saying is... Something that, Gary Vee says a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he does, he does. Um, uh, he, was, he was here last year, I, th I think, or in the last year. On our podcast. This is where I saw it. Um, but what I mean is, like, so for, for now, if, you were to, if I were to start the business and just fall into the place I am now, I'd be pretty happy probably. I'd be yeah. like, sweet, I've got a team, I've got an office, we've got customers. Um, you know, I'm working on, like a lot of what I'm doing is like thinking about where can this product go and mm -hmm. talking to customers about their problems and trying to come up with solutions. That's awesome. Um, but it took a while to get here, Yeah. right? So now I'm in the place where I probably want to be. Yeah. Um, but but that's the point, right? Like you, you it must have been weird going from like senior policy advisor to like inputting numbers on spreadsheets and that kind of like you know the kind of shitty tasks you have to do at the start of a startup. Oh, How man. was that on the ego? Mm. Um, <laughs> oh man, because like a lot of dude. people don't talk about that either. Nah, <laughs> nah. Yeah, dude, my ego hit was pretty big because um, I went yeah from sitting in an office to delivering food to an office. Yeah. Mm. Um. Yeah. Shit. I think. You kind of have to, because at, at the start of Hamper when it was called Cater Crew, they did automated. Like they, yeah. did, it wasn't automated. They just delivered the food yeah. themselves. Yeah, so we, we we literally were just like lugging food around the city, trying to <laughs> trying to get into offices. And actually, like legit. Um, yeah, it's a big ego hit. It's you also feel like you're not putting your best skills to use. Mm. Um, but I think that's kind of part of the process when you have to do. So now for me, and you know, I'm not even like think of someone who's built a company from nothing to like a series C. So uh, C, C, 50 to 100, is it? It's, let's say they got 100 employees, right? Yeah. Um, for someone like that, that's actually built it from ground up all the way to the top, they will still know everything in the business because they yeah. built it from the start. So mm. at the start, you'll feel like you're not putting um, your best talents to use. But I think that it's important to do that because if you like you need to know everything about your business to grow you can't you mm. cannot step away and in the first year of your life uh, of, of your business your business becomes your life yeah like a hundred percent there's no uh if some you know, yeah 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 buts about it. it it's crazy um but yeah so i think i think that you need to have be mentally prepared to take that risk mm -hmm. and just appreciate that it's going to suck but but if you know what you're going for and what you're trying to achieve, it'll yeah, be worth it, it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And and also you need, the, the other thing is you need to like put into place like uh, benchmarks. Like, okay, if in three months time this, I'll call it quits if this happens or I'll keep going if this happens. Yeah. Because or else you don't know how to rea like reality check yourself. Um, but yeah, for uni students, I'd say looking back now, and I know it's always easy being someone older saying, oh, I would have done this in uni. But mm -hmm. I, I do think that you have a lot of time at university for learning um, and a lot of time for, for doing things to like, that will kind of improve your skill set to build a business down the track. Uh, but I think also uni is a good time. You, you guys get like three month holidays? Yeah, it's a long <laughs> Three months is ridiculous, yeah. man. And when you think about it, I'm making a generalization here, but most uni students, I feel, um, make more money in the holidays than they need to spend in the holidays. Yeah, definitely. Would that be correct? Yeah. So, you, you know, because uni students usually work, so you, you, most uni students are poor um, and, you know, you're just kind of making it by week to week. So the holidays are when you're working more so you can, yeah. So I feel like if you just saved up one holiday so that the next holiday you didn't have to work, why don't you do that? Yeah. And and then spe spend a full 100% of your time. If you, if you spend like, 
three months, even if you spend six weeks on something full time, you'll get pretty far. Mm. Mm. Um, and without distractions, yeah. like the only yeah. distraction would be like gym for you and yeah. you two probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in the CrossFit now, but I'm slowly transitioning back into gym. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Oh, he looks, like, he looks bigger than you. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, I thought he was going to be. <laughs> I'm going to cry after this. <laughs> 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 oh, um, yeah, but anyways. Um, what was it? Yeah, so I, th- I think for uni students, the biggest thing I can say is um, use the time effectively. You've got, if you're at uni for three years, uh, then you've got, you know, three sets of holidays and mid- midterm breaks that you can use pretty effectively. Um, don't worry so much about um, internships and stuff until you're very That's last. That's a big year. thing, just comparing yourself, staying yeah. in your own lane kind of thing. Yeah, and so so my, the advice I'm giving, first of all, I hate giving advice because there's no, it's just my, based on my experience, yeah. this is what yeah, I think, please speak to other people because I'm probably wrong. Um, but my advice would be, um, if you know that you want to give entrepreneurship a crack or you want to do your own startup or something like that, instead of thinking about it, you know, for, for year after year, mm-hmm. Set aside some time, maybe three months at, at some point in during your uni um, uni career, and then take that time to just delve into something. Yeah. Um, make sure it's an idea that I think you're passionate about, or oh, actually, yeah, okay, oh, yeah. Make sure it's an idea that you like, but uh, just on that. What was that point, hesitation? Oh, uh, it's just uh, I a lot of so many people now, uh, and I hate it when like people come outside of a startup and or, or people or investors or universities or academics will come outside and look at a startup and say oh this success, this successful startup displayed these characteristics so everyone should display them right yeah um i i you know and and that's why everyone's like oh only do something that you're extremely 110,000 percent passionate about and you believe in the cause and all that mm-hmm. shit right whereas i feel like yes one out of ten one out of maybe 50 times that might be the case but I actually think that there, there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there. In fact, most entrepreneurs um, just love the challenge mm. of building yeah. something, mm. of making something. And that, you know, building something from the ground to success might be one year, might be five years, might be 10 years. But that doesn't mean that's your life's work. Your, yeah. your life's work, like, and that's why like serial entrepreneurs, some people will build something, sell it, take six months off and build the next. So you're on yeah. your right. And that, yeah, that's what I'd like to do because for me, it's more the challenge of um, building something is is the rush, mm. right? Yeah. Just problem solving. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent problem solving. Exactly. So, so anyways, if you're if you're someone at uni that thinks that um, startup is something you want to give a go, I'd hundred percent say just put some time aside, cut all your friends off, <laughs> just do it for three months. Yeah. Um, and see how you go. Yeah. And do it with everything. Like, don't don't half ass a startup. There's no such thing. He hustles really hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to hustle. You have to. Like, man, like, we li- I, when we started this, now, it doesn't matter. We, our customers are probably not listening to this, so it's fine. Like, I, w- I was selling things. That, I was selling everything, and I had nothing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> quite literally nothing. Um, yeah. And, and that's, so with the lean startup thing as well, I was talking to someone this morning, actually, um, and he... He's this guy. He's wanted some advice. He's doing his own startup, or oh, potentially he's he's thinking about doing a startup. And he's like, "Oh, you know, uh, I, I'm going to try and raise some money so that I can, um, you know, leave work for a bit to do all these things." And I was like, "Man, just pretend like put a website up and just write like um, inquire within. So there's no buy button or anything." I was like, "Just go and sell a product. Pretend like it's re- legit and go and sell it to as many people as you can." Mm-hmm. And just do it. And then if people are actually like, yeah, I'm going to yeah, pay you just now. Just validating it first. Mm-hmm. Like, like I, I, but oh, I find, I feel like it's everyone, like it's, that point is labored so high, like validate your product. But so many people don't do it properly. Mm. And um, I think it's because when you have an idea, ego drives you. Mm. Like I'm, I'm a victim of this as well. Um, so you're like, oh, fuck, nah, this, this is good. Oh, I'm not allowed to swear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, this is gonna. Um, this is gonna be successful. I'm just gonna do it. Mm. Um, you you kind of. I think it's important to just you know take a second and say, let me get a hundred people to say that. And when you're at uni, you can. Yeah. yeah so it's easy. Yeah, yeah, we have a really good network right now. Just like validating, <laughs> just a hundred people just can do it like that yeah. kind of thing. Do you, Do you guys find? I'm asking you a question, but do you guys find that being at uni, you're at Sydney, mm. Sydney Uni, for example, is it? Would you say that it's difficult to validate a product because the you know, the cohort here might be quite, not homogenous, that's not the right word, but 
You know, I wouldn't say it's homogenous at all. I think it's like an extremely diverse yeah. university. Mm. Yeah. No. People what what I mean is, sorry, um, not not in terms of uh, beliefs, but in terms of age and things like that. So if everyone's a uni student here and you try to Most of the ideas we have, though, are like geared For towards yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah. literally, we're in the position where we can go on Eastern Avenue on like a Thursday afternoon and in an hour we could have 100 people walk by and just yeah. talk to them. And that's why like you get a lot of people in societies like Enactus that are starting yeah. sort of their own startups and they just, yeah, they just get people off the street and yeah, just sort of yeah, test yeah. their products. Yeah, I right, think like right. university is like a fantastic breeding ground for just validating Yeah, ideas. maybe if we had ideas that were geared towards a different age demographic, it may yeah. be hard. Yeah. But yeah. I think all of our ideas... Uh, I, I, I think it's really awesome that there's so much startup activity happening at, at uni now. Um, it wasn't like that when I was mm. at uni. Um, it was more like you're an outlier if you thought about starting yeah. a business. But I think it's really good. Um, I, oh, I'm, I'm in two minds about the whole like university incubator model mm. thing. Like, um, I don't know, you guys w- might disagree with you guys on this one, but I, yeah, I think like early stage incubators often attract people who are actually wanting to be in corporate and just using this as like a, a bit yeah, of something to put sure. on their resume yeah, yeah, sometimes. Sure. So um, I, I'm, I'm cautious of them. Mm. Yeah. Bit. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you yeah. definitely get those. Yeah. But coming back to the stress thing, I know you don't have much work-life balance in the first year, especially yeah. at Hamper and stuff, but can you talk about that? Because I think something from my notice, when I was with you in that time kind of thing, when I was talking to you, your eyes were like darting everywhere, your, like yeah. your thoughts were everywhere. But now, <laughs> now, now you're like, since um, post-raise, you seem a lot more chill mm. and like... Yeah, do you have like a sense of balance in your life now? Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think I've had to claw that balance back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. In the first year or, you know, first year and a half even, um, it, it progressively gets crazier and crazier. Um, well, for me, it did anyway. It's like, I guess it depends. And a lot of it depends with when you're going to get your cap- capital injection because if you get money and you don't have to worry about m- money so much, and I know that money shouldn't be the most important thing, but if you can coast and you're like, yeah, I'm going to get a salary and I can just focus mm-hmm. on my business, it's a different kind of mm-hmm. mindset. Yeah. Um, but t- yeah, my eyes were darting. And the, <laughs> like the reason being, uh, at that point, like I was the one working on the business, mm. right? Um, and we were doing a lot, actually, for, for, for a smaller you, company. You always but kept it together, though. You never want to take your stress out of anyone else, but you can see that, like... Yeah, no, I, I, and that's not in my nature. Like, I yeah. try not to take my stress out on other people. Yeah. Um, I don't know if my wife would say that. <laughs> um, but, no, uh, yeah, it, it, it's because at the same time, you have to hold so many thoughts in your mind. Yeah. And, you know, you like it was weird. Like, I knew that I couldn't just do one thing at one time it, or else I wouldn't get my, through my day. Um, but I don't think it's sustainable and I don't think it's the right thing to do. Like there's um, challenging yourself and there's reward from, you know, solving problems. But then there's also just like outright just like screwing yourself over from a mental health point of view. Yeah. Um, and I definitely think I, I was pretty close to hitting that. Um, I probably did. I don't yeah. know. Uh, it, and I, yeah. I think if you can push, because inevitably anyone that's running a business will hit a point where you're actually like, I'm like, I'm fucked. Mm. Like, I I don't know what to do. Mm. Um, And that's where the kind of grit comes in. Uh, Yeah, to push through. But also you need to know when to stop. It's hard hard to know that line between like actual mental health stuff and like kind of grinding. Because I feel like all over Instagram, you see this shit about like hustling all the time, blah, 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 blah. But it gets to a point where it's actually just unhealthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um. And I think you need to have that kind of self-awareness mm. of like when you're grinding out. Or, and if you don't have that self-awareness, then you should try and surround yourself with people who will pull you up when they think you're going down. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so look, there's a, you, know, you can work for a startup and have that startup lifestyle of solving problems and you know, uh, having an impact on a product and, and a solution um, without being the founder. Right, yeah. so I, I just think founder stress, and uh, founder stress is just the next level of stress. It, it's another level of stress. It's mm. um, yeah, even now I stress, but I think um, I've learned to manage my stress a lot better mm. and compartmentalize certain things. Like I try my best now. Um, I don't care if I come into the office at six a.m. and leave at ten. I'm not going to take work home. Mm. Yeah. Like, no. Nah. So you don't work on the weekends anymore? No, nah, no. Nah, I've, I've, uh, if I do work on the weekends, I've compartmentalised that as well. So I've got a room that okay. I go in and do work. If yeah. I'm in the kitchen yeah. or in the lounge, I'm not working. So do you mm. think you're like kind of present when you're not working now with, when you're with your wife? Or yeah, that kind of 100%. Stuff? Yeah. And that's, that's the scariest thing. Honestly, um, 
the worst thing is when work starts to affect or startup starts to affect all of your relationships. Yeah. And Did then, you find that in the first year of Hamburg? Yeah, for yeah. sure. Man, I like, um, like stopped talking to uh, most of my friends, I would yeah. say. Um, and even like at home with my wife, like I could tell that, you know, I wasn't present. Mm. Um, even when I was like trying to relax and watch a movie, my mind was, I knew yeah. that my mind was not there. Um, and that's, uh, you know, there were probably a few times when I was like, oh, I'm, I might call this. Mm -hmm. And that's when my ego was like, nah, you're not going to call it. You're going mm. to keep pushing through. Yeah. Um, now I'm glad that I did push through probably. Mm. Um, but, you know, it was pretty close, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, but that's a side of start, a start that a lot of people just don't talk about, I think. Mm. Mm. Um, and founder mental health is, is a real issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you do hear a lot about like, obviously people romanticizing the journey, but then the whole like startup burnout rate, like it's huge, like yeah. mental health and startup the space. depression and anxiety rate is huge. Like mm -hmm. I was sort of starting, I can't remember exactly, but it was like absolutely crazy. It was like four or five times the normal person. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me, I think. It, it, it's just a lot of pressure to deal with, man. Yeah. Um, but I, know, I, I just want to, one thing I want to say is, like, I feel like I'm saying, oh, it's all doom and gloom and it's mm. all hard. I wouldn't be here now mm. unless I thought it was worth it. Yeah. yeah. Right? What are some um, of the highs that you can, like... Oh, incredible. The highs, are, it's, it's like, the highs are so good, like, so high. Um, oh, so, for example, we moved into a new office in the city, like, town hall with a view and I remember on the first or the second day everyone had kind of left and we still hadn't furnished much but um, we had a few tables and, and a couple monitors there and then everyone had left and it was a bit late and I kind of sat there and this is just three weeks ago so this is just a recent high but it, it was just like this whole shit moment like like dude like whoa all that yeah. crazy stuff and, and here I am now and yeah it, 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 there are so many highs and wins every single day and every single week. And I think the biggest thing that I've learned to get through the day and get through the, the grind is to appreciate every single fucking win. Mm -hmm. um, because if you, if you focus on everything that's hard, it'll, you'll, you'll just burn out. Um, and there are lots of wins, man. And when you're a startup, you know, people are usually nicer to you. Um, and you can, you know, you're going to have wins. Even getting one customer by one thing, it's like, yeah, sick. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, we got that today. Or, you know, I got, uh, uh, hit this target of whatever. Just set yourself mini goals, hit them, um, grind through every single day. Um, and before you know, know it, every six months you can look back and go, oh, shit, we've actually come, come pretty far now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, companies, companies aren't built in a day. Um, companies take years to build. And I think that's something that people need to appreciate. Um, and, you know, even when companies are successful, they go through bad times. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, uh, the challenges are always there, right? They just get yeah. different as, mm. yeah, yeah, definitely. So definitely ce celebrate the wins. Um, I, I guess what, what I'm saying is just appreciate that it's, that it can be very difficult at the start. Um, and if, I guess if you appreciate that it's going to be difficult and you set yourself up to be prepared for it, then you can get through it a lot, yeah. um, mm -hmm. a lot better. You stopped gymming and stuff, right, in that first year. Yeah, do you I think that was a good man. decision or not? Stop gymming, mm -hmm. stop playing basketball. See, now mm -hmm. I'm back. I'm playing basketball three times a week, gymming four times mm -hmm. a week, um, eating healthy. Like it's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a terrible idea. Yeah, yeah. I should have kept yeah. going. Um, yeah, absolutely terrible idea. Like today, Steve, he was like, "Oh, I'm, I want to get this thing out, um, and I'm probably going to work all weekend for it." Mm -hmm. and I was like, "No, you're not." Like. You're, we're always going to be screwed. Yeah. yeah. There's always going to be work. But if you're always trying to finish uh, finish more work, yeah. then you're just never going to have a life. So, yeah. no, nah, uh, uh, having a life is so important to growing a business. Mm. Um, and I guess I wish I set more time aside to have a life in the first first year or so. Like I lost a ton. Like I'm, yeah, I lost a ton of weight. Um, I, I um, yeah, just got unfit, unhealthy, mm. yeah, no good. But um. And, and that in turn makes you, because I mean, physical health has such a big impact on mental stamina and mental health, right? Sure. Um, waking up in the morning when you're healthy or if you go, go for a run or something and getting mm. into work, like you feel great, you feel good. Or if, you, if you're physically, if you're in shape, man, you feel good. Mm. Um, and if you're eating healthy, your mind and your body, everything's good. But if, you're, if you cut all of that out, then you just feel yeah, and you probably get a lot less productive. So, oh, so absolutely, it doesn't really work absolutely, out. yeah. I've, I still tried to do productivity hacks when I was um, 
or like body hacks when I was um, yeah, going crazy. Yeah, intermittent fasting and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I tried. Um, I'm still a massive believer in intermittent fasting, though. I've been doing it for about four years. Oh, wow. So yeah. you don't have breakfast? I've never had breakfast. Yeah. I, I, yeah when, no. When's your first meal? About one. Okay. One thirty After the triple shot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I have a, yeah. I have a coffee strong coffee in the morning. Mm. Um, Do you get a crash from that? I don't, I don't smash my coffee. Okay. I kind of sip through it. Yeah. Mm. Um, have you heard of the rice. Bulletproof coffee? Yeah, I've tried it before. Did it work? Um, What's that? It's like, so it's a bit of, you put a bit of butter into your coffee <laughs> instead of milk, and it's to have a slow release because it's the yeah. fat, so it's slow release, it releases the caffeine, and it's meant to not like stop the crash from the coffee. Yeah. But b- Bulletproof goes alongside, you Game have to changes. do a whole, a whole bunch of other stuff to your body too. Yeah. Like you can't have... It's like you have to be in ketosis, in ketosis as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So what has intermittent fasting done for you? Um, for me, it's um, a mental thing. So um, I, and look, sorry, two things, not mental and, and physical as well. So number one, mentally, I feel as though uh, when I have my first meal in the day, I have like a carb crash a little yeah. bit afterwards, right? I feel so, that a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's pretty natural. So um, so when I have that coffee in the morning and I've had nothing but water and coffee, um, my mind's like kind of spiking up and I, yeah. and I, I can go... From like say if I start work at seven thirty in the morning, I can go till twelve and I'll be like, like mm. right mm. at this level. Hungry at all or no? No, nah, no, nah, I don't. I mean, I've been doing it for for a long time, mm. so my body's used to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll be performing it at kind of a, a pretty peak level, and then I'll eat my meal and I'll start to slow down a bit, and then yeah. you know throughout the day, then then I keep going. But for me, that first you know four hours of productivity is incredible. Yeah, wow. it's really really good. Um, the other reason I do it, and I still do it, um, is because. When you work in a startup, or when you work in anything that's demanding, or you're doing anything that's really demanding, whether it finals at uni, right? Like, you don't have time to give a shit about what you eat. Yeah. Like, you just, like, even as important as it might be, when, when life and shit hits the fan, you just can't watch what you eat. So, for me, intermittent fasting means that I have two big meals a day. It means that I just cannot get, um, I, I can not worry about what I eat, but still stay within my calories. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes life easier. Makes life a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I, do you count calories I, and stuff? Or no, I don't count calories, but I did try intermittent fasting yep. briefly. This was when I had a really hectic period of my life. Yep. I was um, helping yep. a friend manage a business, my, yep. my own business. I was working like three jobs, and I was at university. Jeez. And I basically was sleeping from like two a.m. to seven a.m. Yep. every day. So I didn't even have time to have breakfast. So I'll just have a black coffee in the morning, and my energy levels were crazy. Yeah. yeah Craziest really like four months of my life. Why and, did yeah. you stop? I don't actually know. I think it was because I wanted to put on weight because I got really skinny. Like, I actually like started to get abs just like naturally and got <laughs> real skinny. But I just nice. wanted to like be a bit bulkier. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm, um, I'm massive advocate for it. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, give it a go again. Just yeah, have more, should, have more yeah. food at night. Yeah. Uh, before yeah. before we wrap things up, I want you to tell the story about how you met your wife. Oh <laughs> man, it's not even it's not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> it's cute. Um. Oh jeez. Mm. On, on a podcast? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all believe in true love here. <laughs> oh, man. Um, oh, jeez. Uh, so, a uh, number of years back, I used to work in, in the city in Martin Place. And every day I had this routine. Like, I finish work. Um, like, I, I, I've always been a routine person. Like, wake up, make my bed. Um, you know, go to work. Have, uh, you know, have the same lunch. Have, blah, blah, blah. Everything's mm. routine. So, I'd finish work. Um, at, I think it was every day at like 6.15 or something. And then I'd like walk downstairs um, into Martin Place and walk across and walk through Pitt Street Mall towards the, the gym. So every day I go to the gym, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then one day I, um, I was walking and it was, I was at the lights on like Market Street at Pitt Street Mall there. And I look up and I see this girl and I'm like, oh man, this, this girl's really cute. Like, <laughs> amazing. Um, and then she, then the lights go green. And I, I literally didn't cross the road. Like, I was just looking. I forgot to cross the road. <laughs> um, and then she kind of... Imagine this big guy. <laughs> like she's standing there like... <laughs> um, and then she kind of... Uh, like, I, she walked past and I just, like... she Like, I, I didn't... I just froze. She just walked past. And yeah. I was like... Eh. <laughs> and couldn't say anything. Didn't say anything. Anyways, went home and um, I was living with my best mate at the time. And I, was, I said to I said to him, oh, yeah, dude, I saw this girl. She's amazing. And he's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Shut, <laughs> yeah. Up. Shut up. <laughs> um, and then it was a Thursday that that happened. And I didn't think, like, I was like, oh, whatever, you know. Mm. Didn't think much of it. Next Thursday, same time, same thing, because I'm a man Whoa. of routine. 
walking walking the same place and may, maybe about 20 meters further down the road though not at the lights this time and i'm walking and the same girl walks past again and i freeze again <laughs> like i i was just like what the hell like didn't say anything froze again she's gone and then I, then I told her, I'm like, dude, what the hell? Like, I, I, you're normally quite confident with girls and stuff, right? Or you were back then? Uh. <laughs> 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 you might be heavy. Um, but, and, and then 